Firing Line with William F. Buckley, Jr. Tonight's guest, Mark Lane. Our topic, The Warren Report. Fact or fiction, Mr. Buckley? Uh, Mr. Mark Lane has been around for many years, identifying himself gladly with causes worthy, controversial, and unworthy. He has been a special favorite of the left liberal community in New York City, which he greatly pleased by his myriad activities, ranging from the organization of rent strikes, opposition to bomb shelter programs, involvement in legal and civil rights groups irrespective of government claims that they were communist uh, infiltrated. He was, in short, <clears throat> a hero in important circles in New York well before the assassination of President Kennedy by whoever assassinated President Kennedy. Not, we must assume, from Mr. Lane, Harvey Lee Oswald. Uh, Mr. Lane is a skillful lawyer <clears throat> and has written a best-selling book called Rush to Judgment. The publishers maintain that this book has, quotes, changed history, that single-handedly Mr. Lane has discredited the Warren Report. We are not here to discuss the, the minutia of the controversies raised by the Warren Commission <coughs> and its critics for the simple reason that it is impractical to do so. Uh, rather, we will treat more general questions. I'd like to begin by asking Mr. Lane this. It is widely alleged that sinister forces who have a vested interest in suppressing the real truth as to the identity of the assassin have been here and there killing off crucial people former strippers at Ruby's Joint in Dallas, our truck driver roommates of friends of Oswald, that kind of thing. Uh, how come if you were the man who has changed history, these forces haven't bumped you off, Mr. Lane? Well, I think fortunately uh, we haven't come to that. I would like to comment, if I may, upon uh, portions of your introduction. Uh, it is not just liber liberals and leftists who cannot accept the Warren Commission report. Of course, I think the very best review and most favorable review, which my book received, was in your publication, the National Review. I was talking about your pre-Kennedy uh, reputation, by way of background. Before the assassination. Yes, sir. When I was elected to the there state legislature. There was an assassination, wasn't there? Yes, when I was elected, <clears throat> there's no question about that. When I was elected to the state legislature with the endorsement and support of President Kennedy, that's the left liberal uh, uh, approach you're talking about. In terms of the assassination, though, in terms of the Warren report, of course, the Lou Harris poll shows now that two-thirds of the American people indicate that they cannot accept its conclusions. So I think that it's not even an, uh, an unpopular cause with which I'm associated any longer. And uh, regarding the earlier comments you made, I think the best way to uh, respond to them is probably with the opening line of your book, uh, which I'm afraid I may butcher because I'll just paraphrase it, but it was something like, when you are a controversialist, uh, you can either go mad or ignore genuinely unjust criticism. And I prefer, as you do, the latter course. Well, I, I hope there hasn't been any genuinely unjust criticism yet on this show. Uh, uh, it is, uh, I think, a matter of some importance, as far as the American thinking community is concerned, uh, to investigate um, uh, uh, motives, to investigate one's general attitude towards the events in Dallas. For instance, uh, Harrison Salisbury of the New York Times, who has himself been accused of being much too liberal. Who by, accused by him of that? Harrison Sol uh, uh, me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 has said that uh, Ms. Ms. Mark Lane, quotes, is a New York attorney who has made a career of insinuating that Mr. Kennedy was the victim of a right-wing plot. Yeah, now, what I mean so, by so unjust is criticism is to take that early comment, which he wrote when he did the introduction to the Warren Report, and to ignore his present statement, where he states now, and although the New York Times will not tell you this, although he's the associate managing editor, in the recent review on the Progressive, he's indicated that he finds much substance in my charges. And in a recent Canadian broadcasting mm -hmm. company uh, broadcast, he said if he were asked again, he would not do the introduction to the Warren Report because he doesn't well, have sufficient confidence in it. Well, that, that I was not uh, aware of. What I'm, what I'm trying to see is simply to, to place into perspective is where uh, you figure uh, in terms of the general criticism of the report. Uh, would, would this be fair, fair or not fair to say, Mr. Lane, since we are going to strike out for justice? Excellent. That um, cer certain people, ever since the assassination, both on the left and on the right, 
have been highly un, were, were, were highly dissatisfied by the findings of the Warren Commission, highly dissatisfied because it didn't fit their ideological predisposition. Certain members of the right, for instance, are terribly anxious to find out that somebody in the Kremlin pushed a button <coughs> Uh, and that Oswald was immediately energized, raised his rifle and pulled the trigger. You consider this naive, uh, I assume. But by the same token, we have, for instance, Professor H. Stuart Hughes, shortly after the assassination, writing in The Nation magazine, what most of us at first thought was that the crime had been committed by a Southern racist. Uh, indeed, if we look deeply into our souls, I think many of us will recognize that we were disappointed to learn that such was not the case. Now. I think it's it, true that it those isn't on it, the right yeah. tend to, would like to believe that those on the left were involved in a conspiratorial way, yes. and those on the left have the same feeling about those on the right. Yes, but, you, but your reputation has been as a, a, a left liberal within the spectrum of New York politics, so that people who first look into your association with this particular uh, venture might unjustly, I hasten to add, I think of you as somebody who is trying to rescue uh, uh, Oswald mm. uh, uh, as the putative killer but since because I don't Oswald was a communist. Well, since I don't even say in my book that Oswald was innocent, of course, one cannot really yes, accuse right. me of that motive. Yes, but this is the place, effect of your yes. book, isn't it? No. It uh, my, I think my book shows quite conclusively the shots came from at least two directions and that the law of conspiracy is nothing more, of course, than two or more persons acting in concert to effect an illegal end. So the book says there was a conspiracy to kill the president. So Both our been. host and our guest are speaking softly so far, but I'm sure a few big sticks will be raised before the end of this hour. We'll continue with Firing Line in just a moment. Uh, Mr. Lane, uh, is it or is it not fair then to say that your book does not go further than to say that the Warren Commission didn't take all of the evidence into account, but by no means goes so far as to say that Oswald is exonerated on the basis of your reading of the findings? Well, it goes uh, beyond, I think, the uh, former and not quite as far as the latter. I think the book uh, states quite clearly that the Warren Report is a fraudulent document, not merely that they did not take sufficient evidence into, into consideration, but they distorted evidence, they misused evidence, and what's worse, I think they oversimplified evidence. Well, uh, let me ask you then this so I can, un so I can understand you completely. Uh, assuming per impossibile that Oswald would rise up from the dead, uh, come up here and say, Mr. Lane, I did fire the fatal shot. This would not invalidate your book in any way, would it? Well, I don't think he could have fired the fatal shot because that shot well, clearly came from the right. Book. Yes, because the shot right. came from the right front. But now, if you said I fired one of the shots, yes, that's, that certainly is a possibility. The mere fact that the Warren Commission was totally unable to prove that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's not true. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, is it or is it not? Uh, w would you would you not agree? that um, even though this was a wild, desperate crime pretty much in the category of uh, uh, the criminal who killed McKinley, uh, that uh, even though we are prepared to say that there is no reason to assume that Oswald got orders from the communist apparatus, that nevertheless there was a very considerable record of Oswald's sympathy with the communists, which for, for some reason uh, uh, isn't stressed in your, your book. I say for some reason, you might, you, you might have simply thought it me methodologically irrelevant. I think that the uh, <coughs> political commitments of those who, in terms of the evidence, are proven to be nothing more than spectators, I think that's quite irrelevant to a determination as to where the well, shots came from. Yeah, we, we're not rushing off to say that Oswald was a spectator, are we? I thought that you said that it would not surprise you if, in fact, you pulled one of the... Uh, if it, if, uh, if I in said fact it would not invalidate my book. It would surprise me because I think there's no evidence to show that. I take really <clears> the same position Alfredo Scobie, one of the lawyers for the Warren Commission, takes. And that is, had Oswald lived, he could not have been proven guilty mm -hmm. had he faced trial based upon the evidence the Commission was able to secure. And, and, of course, Warren says that he was a practicing district attorney for 10 or 12 years and that he could have gotten a conviction in 48 hours with the evidence. Yes, you simply disagree with him professionally. That's nonsense. It would yeah. take longer than that to pick a jury, of course. Do you course. think Warren should be impeached? I don't think he should be impeached. I think his report should be impeached. Mm -hmm. Well, but uh, we, we certainly don't want, uh, we certainly don't want um, incompetent chief justices around, do we? Well, we're yeah. used to those. We've had them for many years. Uh, but he, this is the first one you would not impeach. No, I would not impeach any of them. I don't know of any of the chief justices who should be impeached. Uh -huh. But you, you, would, you would think that... Uh, I think the, mere the incompetence <coughs> is not a reason to disqualify a judge. We'd have an empty bench. Yeah, yeah. 
So you, you take a rather severe view about the competence of, of um, our Supreme Court justices. So do I, as a matter of fact. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you wanted to retreat from your position. Well, um, uh, well you uh, see, you see uh, that goes back really to your early position. My position is not arrived at either by my political view or your political view. And I think that the integrity of my book depends not upon my own political <coughs> bias, and of course I have uh, several of them, many of them, but upon the 5,000 citations and references mm -hmm. to the Warren Commission's own evidence, which uh, mark the book from the beginning to the end. Either they're in context <coughs> or they're not, either they're accurate or not. I suggest that they're accurate, and they've not yet been proven by any of the 2,000 reviewers to be inaccurate or out of context so far. Well, now, you just finished quoting a lawyer, Mr. Scobie, that I never heard about. Suppose I quote one that maybe you've never heard about. All right. Uh, he's, uh, he's with the UCLA Law School. Oh, yes, I know. And he that. says, Lane misstated or distorted the record in 15 instances. Lane has threatened to sue. He hasn't. Is that just because you're otherwise engaged, or what? I am going to sue Wesley Liebler for libel, no question about it. Uh, he's clearly pathologically committed to the Commission's case. It's an unfortunate uh, uh, matter, but it's a personal matter, and he has to deal with that with those in another discipline. How would so you feel about people who said the reverse about you, that you're pathologically committed to its opposite? I would say they're in error. Uh -huh. That's that unjust criticism that you made reference to in your first sentence. Your yeah, point. yeah. Well, uh, <coughs> when, you say that, um, when you say that there really isn't uh, sufficient evidence, to incriminate, uh, Mr. Uh, to, to incriminate Oswald, uh, is is it or is it not true that it is conceded the gun was sent to Oswald? It is conceded. It's conceded by the, the Warren Commission, yes. And the post office. And well, the, not really. The See, the post office regulations going, would yeah. prohibit mm -hmm. the post office regulations would prohibit the reception of that rifle by Oswald since it was addressed to A. Hiddell. The commission got around that by accepting false uh, testimony from one of the postal inspectors, which was completely contrary to the regulations. Well, but the law prohibits a lot of things. For instance, the bug conversations that you had with some of your pet witnesses. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, those, those bug conversations continued, right? That which the law prohibits doesn't nevertheless not get done. After all, the, lo the law prohibits the assassination of presidents. And yes, and we know the president yeah. was assassinated. We know also that when you deal with a violation <coughs> of the regulations of the post office, which regulations would prohibit the rifle from reaching Oswald since it was sent to someone named Hadell, that the way to handle that is just as you have, to say that the regulations prohibit this, but a mistake was made. Mm -hmm. The way the commission did it was through this ob oversimplification that I made reference to. They accepted testimony falsely as to what the regulations are. That's true. It may be... Why? To show that Oswald was the lone assassin, mm -hmm. which was the commission's uh, preconception at the very outset. Why? I think uh, we have to go back to that period of November 22, 63, and the trauma that was in our country which was uh, compounded by the murder of the police, by the murder of the alleged assassin while he was being protected <coughs> by uh, some 70 police officers and various FBI agents and Secret Service agents. He was shot to death by an old, intimate, and corrupt friend of the Dallas police force, Jack Ruby. And that added further to the trauma in the country. And there was only one way, as Mr. Rankin, counsel for the commission, said, uh, to meet his commitment. He said the, the commitment of the commission was to reassure the American people. How could they do it? By Mr. Hoover saying, well, ladies and gentlemen of America, the assassins of your president have escaped. They're walking the streets of your cities tonight. Sorry about that. Uh, it was the midst of the greatest security precautions ever taken, but next time we'll try to do better. The very least, people would have demanded the uh, retirement of Mr. Hoover, which would have been certainly one valuable asset, I think, byproduct of the, of the terrible event. Oh, ho, ho, that was hit and run. I beg they your wouldn't pardon? allow that in court, would they? What's that? Mm -hmm. Oh, we're not in your court. Your hit and run now. attack on Mr. Hoover. Well, shall we slow down? No. I'd like to. I'd be happy to discuss it in greater detail. No, don't bother. We're not no. here to discuss Mr. Hoover's credentials. I no. think they're taken right. for granted. At least Just on Mr. The show. Warren's, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, sure, Mr. Warren. Since you, 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 you most specifically accuse him of presiding over a, uh, a whitewash or, or mm. a kangaroo court or whatever you want to talk about. Now, uh, in in the course of approaching the problem the way you did. Aren't you really asking the question, what kind of investigation is absolutely necessary uh, to establish that which is commonly regarded as a certitude? For instance, suppose uh, one would decide at this moment uh, to convene a commission to establish the innocence of, of Dreyfus. It might, it might in fact be hard to do, but uh, isn't the certitude of the innocence of <coughs> Dreyfus? Uh, a, a, a part of your sort of natural e equipment? Uh, aren't you willing to come to historical terms with, with that data? Well, the French government, which originally said he was guilty, reversed itself after mm -hmm. Estahazi 
had confessed that he was guilty. Yes, but, but there, there are a lot of Mark Leans around, you know, who, who make the same objections to the French government's action in the, in the case of uh, Dreyfus, as you were But the man who was guilty Washington. confessed and said that Dreyfus was in no way involved. Oh, you wouldn't have had that. That could have taken you half a chapter to have handled a confession by Oslo, wouldn't it? No, no, you not Dreyfus. Pressure. You said all kinds of things about witnesses. Uh, Are you suggesting who, that Dreyfus was guilty? I don't know. No, no. no, I'm simply saying that the same, as much of a case can be made for the innocence of Dreyfus as for the innocence of Oswald. And they, uh, may, and, and and they, they may both that, have that, been that innocent. Your techniques, yes. which are highly ingenious, um, well, let me put it another way. If, if you're willing to, to believe, I think, that um, uh, either a combination of ruthlessness or uh, some combination of ruthlessness, cynicism, and, and, and sloth uh, committed uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Earl Warren and seven or eight distinguished Americans appointed by the president with the tacit acquiescence of Robert Kennedy uh, and uh, a bunch of uh, hardworking professional lawyers and investigators to come up with a verdict that was palpably uh, indefensible, then, if you're willing to accept that assumption, it becomes simply a, a matter of legal ingenuity, and you're extremely ingenious to contrive an extremely interesting case to go ahead and prove your assumptions. So methodologically, aren't you as much at error well, as you Well, I think if you adopt that minutes? approach, you say there is no truth. We can never discover what mm -hmm. has ever happened. Yeah. I don't believe that that's so. I think we can. And I think there are mechanisms developed so that we can. I think the American judicial system is a sound one. Cross-examination open and public hearings, the right to counsel for the accused. I think these things tend to assist a determination at the well, truth. I, I'm glad and you all of these tend, yeah, yes. because we know about an awful lot of innocent people who are convicted and guilty people who are let Just think go. of how many innocent people would have been convicted if they didn't have those protections. The fact is the Warren Commission made none of those protections available. You know what they did? They took testimony. They've never published the transcripts of the testimony. That's locked up by order of uh, your president for 75 years. Yours too, by the yes. way. Mm, you voted for him. No, I did not vote for him, as a matter of fact. Until uh, September 2039 is when we can, uh, the time must pass until we can examine that. What the commission did was to publish a printed version, but in volume one of the uh, reports, the commission states that it reserved the right to edit the testimony, to edit the transcript, to improve the accuracy and the clarity of the witness's statement. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that frighten you a little bit about that well, power? It, it, no more so than that I don't have access to the notes that went into your book. I'm sure that every time you bumped into a witness who said, yes, Mr. Lane, I saw him and he was Oswald, he very likely didn't uh, figure prominently in your, your book. You're saying General, because you are an advocate. You are an advocate. Rights. Is the While Warren Commission reserving rights, may I reserve the right to break in here and say we'll continue with firing line in just a moment. Well, M Mr. Lane, <clears throat> uh, I gather that the burden of your charge is that that evidence uh, that the Warren Committee secreted away, the, the, the loose notes, the, 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 the notebooks and so on, uh, would, were it uh, publicly accessible, tend to undermine the Warren Commission's case. Otherwise, would it not simply be a, a perfectly matter-of-fact and conventional a way of uh, uh, of exercising uh, editorial judgment. For instance, I, I find it impossible to read everything that Ruby said in his own interview with the Warren Commission uh, investigators simply on the grounds of its inherent unintelligibility. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, don't, they, uh, don't they have some, some sort of a right to uh, uh, exercise editorial judgment, assuming that we trust their integrity? I'm surprised you asked that question, because you know that can never be done in a trial, in any court. Uh, no judge edits the testimony and then presents it to the jury or to the public. <clears throat> and in this, our most important case, the jury was the American people, I think. And uh, we have the right to look at the unintelligible statements made by Mr. Ruby and the unintelligible questions asked by Chief Justice Warren as well. I think that that's, that's one of our basic rights in a democratic society, which yes, we have, right? Yes, yes. Well, I, I think it may be a basic right which is in and of itself an interesting question. It's not necessarily an interesting question to ask whether or not one must suppose uh, from the fact that certain of the evidence, let's say CIA reports from uh, Havana to Washington, uh, uh, why uh, it's not necessarily an interesting <coughs> question to ask whether or not access to those is indispensable to the making of a responsible judgment. Oh, I don't think that secret material of that nature should be revealed, but that's not the problem. We have the photographs and the x-rays of the president's body, <coughs> which would resolve the, co the classic question in the case very likely, mm -hmm. the origin of the shots. Now, it, uh, President Johnson was asked at a recent press conference by Mr. Spivak why it was 
that the Warren Commission never examined those very those invaluable documents and why no non-governmental person can now look at them and President Johnson replied that they were available to the Commission I think that didn't answer the question the first portion and secondly he said we wouldn't want them paraded around at every sewing circle in America well no one really suggested that I, I think that competent pathologists should have examined these invaluable documents and rendered an opinion to the Commission and today independent experts not associated with the government should be given the right to do that. Don't you believe that's so? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But I do think that it's not uh, exactly fair to blame Lyndon Johnson for what Warren did or didn't do. Well, uh, it's pro called pro the Warren... Provided Warren had access to those photographs, uh, presumably the relevant question is to ask, did he feel he needed to see them? Did he feel that <coughs> the centimetric measurements given to him by the doctor might have been wrong. Of course, the uh, FBI at, uh, report yeah. originally said the, the, the doctor ended up by saying the bullet entered the neck yeah. and exited at the throat. Yes. Now we have some serious problems with that. The Secret Service agent in charge of the detail, who was in the limousine, the commission said this was the first bullet, and the back ripped through the Adam's apple. But Roy Kellerman said after the first bullet was fired, the president said, my God, I am hit, in a clear New England Boston accent. He said it wasn't Governor Connolly. He doesn't talk that way at all, which I think is quite so. Now, the question is, if the bullet hit the president in the back of the neck and ripped through his Adam's apple, and that was the first shot, how was it possible for him to say clearly and distinctly in that New England accent, my God, I am hit? Is I that, don't know. I no, don't neither know. do I. No, nor do I know whether it can be done or whether it can't be done. With one's Adam's apple yeah. torn out. Well, I, I, honestly, I don't know. I don't know what you can do without an Adam's apple without a liver. Uh, and, and well, I he think may have said it without a liver, no, but well, that's I, not I think the this, this, this is one of these power technically impressive right, then we, points. Then really we go to another one. Okay, yeah, maybe, I was going to. But, but let's, in the, let's in the meanwhile meditate over the fact that doctors who are not, so far as we know, engaged in any kind of a conspiracy to deny you the truth uh, uh, reaffirm their judgment of the likelihood that it did emerge from the throat, recognize that as a result of the mutilation of the throat at the time that the tracheotomy was performed, it was impossible by visual inspection to prove it or not prove it. And it's also recognized that Mr. Redlick of the Warren Commission said that he was principally uh, uh, impelled to the, th the single bullet thesis by the fact of the bullets not existing and that under the circumstances he grants it's a hypothesis, but grants it's the most reasonable conceivable hypothesis. It's the only hypothesis which d will explain how Oswald could have mm. been the lone assassin, well, actually, and that's why it was another chosen. One. Actually, let, me, let, me, let me just finish the <coughs> point, though, because it's more than just the uh, uh, inability, I think, to speak with one's Adam's apple torn out. The FBI agents, Siebert and O'Neill, who were present with, during the autopsy on November 22nd, quote Dr. Humes as stating, they were there, they saw the wound. The wound was some five inches down in <coughs> the back, to the right, two inches to the right of the spinal column, the Dr. Humes probed the uh, wound with his fingertip and said the bullet went in a short distance and did not exit. Now, that's the first contradiction. The doctors at Parkland Hospital who examined the wound, there was a tracheotomy, but they performed it. And before they performed it, they examined it, and they said the wound in the throat was a clear puncture wound, an entrance wound. And each of the three doctors who made a public statement that day said the wound was clearly an entrance wound. Uh, yeah, but so Lane, all but I <coughs> say is a sufficient uh, question on this point so that Earl Warren or, or anyone else who uh, wished to conduct a thorough investigation <coughs> was compelled to examine the best evidence, the photographs and the x-rays. Well, look, I, I wish he had, and I, I hope that if he doesn't, somebody else will, and preferably before sundown tomorrow. But I also believe that the, the, the investigators of the Warren Commission uh, had every reason to suppose that the report of the autopsists uh, was, was legitimate, uh, and that report of the autopsy took every conceivable hypothesis and opted for the one they reported uh, as the compelling well, one under the circumstances. we don't know that because the original notes uh, which were prepared by Dr. Humes uh, who, who <coughs> performed the autopsy, we cannot see. If we turn to volume 17, page 48, I think, we'll see the statement. This is to certify that I have destroyed by burning my original autopsy notes. The photographs and x-rays no one has seen unfortunately, well, on the testimony of Jacqueline really Kennedy. Only, only recently, uh, uh, one of the autopsists uh, uh, divulged uh, a sketch that he had made at the point in which he actually measured the distance between the wound and, and the neckline. Right, and he put the dot which was down. was very inconvenient to your own thesis. Not at all. It's completely consistent no. because he put the bullet down five inches from the neck, and if the bullet was fired from six stories above, entered five inches <coughs> below the throat, how could it come out of the throat? And if it did go in that fashion, how did it then, in midair, decide to go downward and into Governor Conway's back? Here we are, off into the... Because, uh, all right.
for the record, I can answer that argument, but I think yes. we ought to try to go into them. Uh, he maintains that there was a discrepancy between his freehand drawing of the X right. on the back and the actual measurement. Correct. Uh, and I can understand that uh, no doctor is supposed to be an artist with an absolute uh, 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 total uh, precision uh, as a draftsman when he actually has to sketch out the point. No, but most doctors know the difference between the neck and the back, I think even if they're not artistic. Well, and yeah. again, the question is present, and there's a way to resolve it. Why can't we resolve it by examining the photograph? I, I'm up for it. I'm up for it. All right. But uh, what, I, what I think we ought to discuss primarily is the extent to which whatever the delinquencies of this examination were, and I think you will probably agree, especially as a lawyer, uh, that uh, if one turned somebody like you loose on, uh, on the most open and shut case in the history of the world, you'd be able to write an extraordinarily ingenious book. That's very kind yes, of you. Yes, I, I, I really believe it. I really believe it. And that under the circumstances, what we really have is, is a sort of a national obsession. Uh, and uh, all, all of the tributaries that flow into the making of that obsession are themselves interesting. There is a, the, 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 the natural desire for sleuthery. Everybody wants to, everybody's interested in it. Some people even think it's fun. Some people would uh, like to know who killed their president and why he yeah, died. Yeah. And that's not really an obsession, is it? Well, it is in a sense. Because if it could bring him back to life, then I would agree with you it was not an obsession. But all right, let's, but assume, certainly are other let's assume that Oswald had a cousin uh, and that that uh, uh, cousin uh, uh, conspired with him on that grassy no. Uh, I think that it's in and of itself a, a, an interesting venture to try to find out who he is. I'm all for you trying to find out who he is. But I smell something else going on here. Because uh, if there is that cousin, uh, I doubt A, that he will ever be found. But whether he's found or not, something else has meanwhile happened. Uh, and that is that you have apparently succeeded in persuading the majority of the American people that we cannot trust the most august conceivable panel to do a responsible job. Yes, I believe that that and, is and true. I, we and, cannot and I, trust them. And I think that the criticism is different from that. I think that we are entitled to say that this august panel didn't do the kind of a job that would protect them against Mark Lane's of the future and should have. But this is very different from the first charge. Well, I think what we can say, I think we can go a bit beyond that, that, there, that the American people have a right to say we cannot trust Earl Warren or the... Uh, other four Republicans, or the two Southern Democrats, who made up the commission, which the New York Times referred to as a politically well-balanced commission. Why did you say two Southern Democrats? Did you mean to insinuate something? Well, of course. <laughs> now, what? Surely you understand. They're racists? Surely you understand that in the Democratic Party there's a split, and that we ended up with a commission, which the New York Times assured us was politically well-balanced, but in fact we had a commission which was made up of not a single Kennedy supporter. I think that raised the question at the outset in terms of faith. But I'd like to go beyond that, you because I think that faith is really... Not a single Kennedy supporter? No. Uh, would you say that Warren was anti-Kennedy? Well, I don't know if he was anti-Kennedy. He was a Republican. He was a Republican governor, Republican attorney general. He was a Republican candidate for the, for the vice uh, president. He's, but he's not a Kennedy supporter. Do, do you think that he would have preferred Nixon to Kennedy in 1960? Well, that's a question you'd have to put to him. I don't know what his politics yeah, are But, but you're, you're apparently very much interested by this. Uh, this, 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 I is, think this is the workings of your mind now. No. Two Southern Democrats and no Kennedy supporter. Well, don't you think that... Equals a fix. Well, that's your conclusion. Yeah. Certainly, yeah, but, certainly but you're entitled to that you may it, be uh, right, Bill. But there, there are intonations, I think, that uh, you're an interesting man. Uh, and the way you approach this is in and of itself interesting. Yeah, I approach it in this way. I say if it's a politically well-balanced commission, which it was not, it still is not entitled to our faith. We talk, you talk about faith in these institutions or faith in the FBI as if it's a religious experience to read the Warren Report. I think that the contrary, that all we're supposed to have faith in a democracy is in our own ability to look at the facts and reach our own conclusions. I, I have not known you in the past to have invested such a vast amount of faith in either Earl Warren or in the government. And I'm surprised that in this one instance you're willing I to. I haven't, and I'll show you how. <laughs> you're, you're watching a careful scrutiny of a careful analysis of a careful investigation. William Buckley of Mark Lane of the Warren Report, and we'll continue in just a moment. Here, I think, is the distinction, Mr. Lane. It is one thing to say uh, that the Warren Court or the President of the United States uh, has a bungled a job uh, that he's reached, that they have reached the wrong conclusions, that we need all the facts on the basis of which we can judge whether they were right or they were wrong. And incidentally, in a democracy, it is commonplace not to have all the facts. You certainly don't have all the facts on foreign policy on the basis of which we can say yes or no. But you, you 
I think, are going a very considerable step further. Yes. You're implying something very like perfidy. Uh, and in, in, in doing so, it seems to me that there is a kinship between your approach and that, say, of Mr. Robert Welch on Eisenhower. Uh, he figures uh, a posteriori that you can conclude that Mr. Eisenhower was a communist on the basis of the I wouldn't go that configuration. Uh, well, you might dislike him less if you could prove it. <laughs> on the basis of the configuration of the evidence of his entire career. Now, you do understand this is a graver charge than simply to say that Eisenhower was a sort of an inadequate president. But aren't you saying that Mr. Warren, I mean, you, ac you actually said <coughs> that the police in Dallas actually uh, uh, suppressed the right rifle and surface right. So, so you, you're, well, you're really talking about. I haven't really said that. I haven't said that. Your I raised the facts. Hmm? Your committee in 1964 said serious questions must be asked as to possible police participation in the assassination. Well, the commission took the same position, but those questions had to be asked, conducted investigation, and they were satisfied. I'm not satisfied that the, the yeah. investigation on that question was who's, adequately who's conducted. Who the word serious? Yours? Because... Wait, uh, we had, in what context uh, is I, that? I, I, suppose, suppose I were to say, the question has arisen whether Eisenhower is a communist. Hmm. That's different from saying serious questions have arisen as to whether or not he's a communist, isn't it? Obviously, the Warren Commission has to recognize the raising of questions, but the word serious is an evaluative adjective, and that is yours, as I understand it. I it? don't know if I use it. I would use it at this point, certainly, mm -hmm. in examining the evidence. Yes, there are serious questions. We have a Dallas police officer who finds a weapon, says it's a German Mauser, 7.65 millimeters. Mr. Weitzman is that? Yes. But he never right. examined it personally, did he? Well, this is what else he said. It had a 418 scope. The bolt was uh, worn in the back and was blue. He described the sling and the stock. That's a great deal of information to have, as the commission said, at a glance. Then we have Captain Fritz, who picked up the weapon and ejected one live round from it and said it was a German Mauser. And we have another Dallas deputy sheriff also saying it was a German Mauser. And now we have the uh, Warren Commission reporting that the FBI the following day said that their records show that Oswald had purchased an Italian carbine caliber 6.5, and all of a sudden the Dallas police say that's what we mean we found yesterday. Now, I examined that rifle. Uh, when I testified before the commission. I don't know very much about foreign weapons. I know a little bit about American Army weapons, but it's a foreign weapon. But at once I knew it was not a German Mauser 7.65 millimeters because in large, clear letters, it said on it, made Italy caliber 6.5. Mm. The commission implies that Weitzman must be some kind of a fool, and one, assuming he's a Dallas policeman, might accept that too quickly. But uh, <laughs> he was, in fact, a graduate college engineer. He owned a uh, sporting goods <coughs> shop where he sold rifles and said he's quite familiar with weapons. Well, then Weitzman testified before the commission. Is it not elementary to show him the weapon, the Italian car cannon? No, other things are elementary, too. I think if I were mm. a Dallas policeman prepared to devote my life to confusing you, uh, one of the things I would do if I, uh, you know, if in the course of a working day I assassinated the President of the United States uh, is to simply not uh, arrange for it so that a policeman that I wasn't sure of wouldn't be the first into this room to make that uh, Oh, but you say if the police era. were involved <coughs> in the assassination, which is not an assumption I've made. Well, it's, it's something, about, 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 about something about which you want to raise, quote, serious questions. About, well, certainly serious questions must be raised yeah. when an old, corrupt, and intimate friend of the Dallas police force, uh, when there's evidence given to the commission showing that this man, Jack Ruby, was the bag man for the Dallas underworld, paying off the Dallas police. There's a vast amount of evidence of that nature which the commission, of course, discounted and never even considered. But in any event, it was an old friend of the police well, how force. How is it relevant? Why should it consider it? Why, why should they consider sure. how Ruby entered the basement to kill Oswald and whether or not his relationship with the Dallas police who allowed him to enter uh, is a question. Uh, I, I think, I, I think I it's, think I think it's apparent. I think everybody knows that Ruby was sort of a character around town, that he was known to the police, that he was sort of a... Uh, sort of a camp follower of the police. Well, how did he get and in the basement, there seems, to be, there seems to be no question that he got in precisely because people would think he was harmless. Well, not at there, all. There, no. are, there are a dozen people in this room uh, who could get in precisely because of their familiarity with the surroundings, uh, and, and a precisely suspicion would not uh, attach. Well, that's a broad that generalization, but when you look at the specific evidence, we have a former Dallas police officer, mm -hmm. N.J. Daniels, standing at the Main Street ramp. <coughs> with him is Officer Vaughn, the officer on guard. And Daniels testified that he saw Ruby coming. Ruby had his hand in his jacket pocket. There was a large bulge. It appeared to him that Ruby had a pistol in his pocket. And he was alarmed. And he thought that Vaughn was going to stop him, the officer on guard. But Vaughn looked at him, he said, seemed to recognize him. 
And then he, Ruby went right in. It was only a nine-foot entrance, and there were two men standing there. Ruby would practically have to say, excuse me, to pass by. But now, Mr. the commission said that he didn't notice him go in. But, Mr. Lane, but that's not what the evidence shows. Surely one of your, your difficulties is that when you get down to focus on improbabilities, you would really be committed to the notion uh, that no chief of state would ever, could ever uh, get murdered because such are the improbabilities But we know uh, that people, uh, I I'm sure Julius Caesar was more surprised than the chief of the Dallas police <laughs> when Brutus pulled his knife uh, out. I'm sure there was a bulge there, but nobody thought to <laughs> detain him. And they know who, they uh, know and, who uh, did it right on the I'm scene. I'm sure you could write a book and prove that Brutus was innocent. No, no, we know who did it right on the scene, and I think those who criticize the Dallas police should remember that they did catch Oswald's assailant very quickly. Yes. Yes, that's something in their favor. Yeah, but I, that's right. That, that's but oh, in yeah. addition to this, I, that's why? of course sarcastic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, for a <laughs> moment, I wasn't sure you got that. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, it was uh, I've been practicing. <laughs> it was intended. It certainly was intended that way. I'm not yeah. sure it achieved it. But the uh, the point is, I think, that in the midst of the greatest security precautions ever taken, it was not Caesar who was killed by Brutus, but President Kennedy who was killed by someone, and with the FBI, Secret Service, and Dallas police on hand, whoever did it escaped from the scene. Mm -hmm. If for no other reason, I think we have to give consideration to yes, the, the, the very poor protection and poor detective work yeah. done at the scene and yeah. poor security by the by Mr. Hoover's uh, legions and by the Secret Service and by the Dallas police and deputy sheriffs. Well, well let, let, let me at this point level with you, Miss Lane, because it, there's a sense in which I, uh, I am not a natural adversary of yours here. Uh, I, I don't care really who killed Miss Kennedy. I care very much that he's dead, but I don't care very much who killed him. And if it turns out to be somebody else, uh, then I say, all right, it's somebody else. Let's prosecute him. Let's uh, let's. Well, that's up. if let's, it's Oswald. Let's, let's do what, whatever. That's if it's Oswald's yeah. cousin. But if it's some, yeah. if it's something which is more significant than that, you would care. You well, might care if it was a po something of great I, political I significance. I would, I would, I would say this: that nobody who probably assassinated Kennedy other than Oswald would the discovery of do more to disrupt this nation than if your thesis is ultimately taken seriously that we have Dallas policemen and uh, participating and raising serious questions about whether they participated in the assassination of Kennedy, uh, that we have a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who's willing to conspire to prevent us from having the truth, that we have a crooked and corrupt president and an indifferent uh, members of the Kennedy family who are not willing to cooperate in the true investigation. So nothing much worse, I think, is going to happen, if, even if we forage in that knoll of yours. Well, except you say uh, 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 than, you're willing than, to... Than, than in effect, what is happening is a result of people's lazy acceptance of your own thesis. It wasn't lazy. It was very hard to come by. No, 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 no. Lazy acceptance. Yes. No, no, no. I think you're a stocanovite worker on this. I don't know anybody who knows as much about the case as you do. That was meant to accomplish, wasn't lazy acceptance, yeah. Yes. That's right. You've only sold a quarter of a million books. Uh, and you say 65% of the American people agree with your thesis. So I obviously, say Lou obviously Harris a lot of people just agree with your thesis who haven't read your book. Mm. Uh -huh. Well, originally, of course, everyone agreed with the Warren report before there even was one, including you, as a matter of fact. Sure. Because you said very soon after the assassination that you completely accepted. And it was not Earl I Warren. I did. It wasn't Earl Warren then. No, it I was didn't. the Dallas police you accepted then. You had faith in them. Well, I think uh, that's going too far. Well, I, 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 th I th yes, it may be going too far, but uh, there's a sense in which I felt that the interests of truth were being defended by Robert Kennedy. Robert uh, Kennedy and, was and in Indonesia at the time. Uh, uh, Rob, Robert Kennedy was in the airport in Washington when the body arrived. Oh, yes, at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, I felt that Mr. Kennedy would look after the interest of truth, and that if Mr. Kennedy uh, was willing to accept the judgment, I was willing to accept it, because but I assume don't... that since he was the Attorney General of the United States, he would look into the possibility that would be people were being debonair about who killed his brother, the president. Well, of course, you don't uh, place that faith in Robert Kennedy in everything that he says in the Certainly first place. Certainly not. And the second I, I place, think I, I think you, and I think with good reason that you don't. Uh, no, nah, that's irrelevant. Uh, I'm talking about something highly personal. Yeah, but I would have I would have great faith in you uh, if you told me that you were satisfied that Mr. X was the person who killed your brother, uh, and vice versa. Even though I would disagree with you about any number of political Well, now let's look, let's look at Robert Kennedy as an expert on the question. He's never read the Warren Commission report, much less the 26 evidence, uh, 26 volumes of evidence. I think that eliminates him no, as an expert. It doesn't. No, does it not. Doesn't. No, no. This is naive and, and why is it naive to, uh, for to this think reason. that to think this that an examination most, of the evidence is irrelevant of, to a, a uh, determination as, as to what reason, happened? Most of what we know, we know prescriptively. I know how to establish that the Earth is round because I read somewhere in Encyclopedia how you, how you go about doing it, but I never have. 
Because well, that's I, not a matter of contention at the moment. No, it's not a matter of contention. But who killed President but, but Kennedy But if is. you were to ask me at this moment, have you ever checked on the roundness of the earth, you are otherwise not qualified to speak on it, the answer is no. Yeah, but most, the analogy, I think, fails. Know, the I think the analogy fails because is there, is, there is a question as to who killed President Kennedy, and there is no question today with thinking people as to whether or not the earth is round. Let's take a controversial question and see if you're willing to accept the conclusion based upon no knowledge, yeah, just faith. Uh, we'll have questions. more questions as well as more answers. You are watching a firing line with William F. Buckley, Jr., tonight's guest, Mark Lane, our topic, the Warren Report, fact or fiction. We'll continue in just a moment. Continuing now with firing line, we have our question and answer period. First, uh, Mr. Buckley, this question to you. At this perspective from the assassination, how would you assess its political impact, especially upon the career of Senator Robert Kennedy? I don't think it has, um, uh, at least the questions that are raised tonight, have anything to do with the career of Mr. Kennedy. Uh, I, I think that they might very well have something to do with the career of Lyndon Johnson, because uh, if the suspicion uh, ever becomes uh, widespread that President Johnson uh, is himself responsible for preventing the people from getting to, to the truth uh, of, of, of the subject, then they will not only think that, uh, that uh, this is a failure of the president to exercise his duty, but also that the president has something to fear uh, from, from the ventilation of the truth. And of course, there are, there are already people uh, uh, around, uh, the, the <coughs> cretins, who are actually suggesting that Mr. Lyndon Johnson in some way uh, might have been implicated in the assassination. So that uh, Mr. Johnson's future career, I think, might very easily be uh, influenced by the results of this question. Mr. Lane, uh, would you care to comment on that question or on Mr. Buckley's answer? I think it's a sound analysis, and I think that it can be harmful to uh, President Johnson's career. But since his main rival in the Democratic Party for the nomination, if not in 1968, and as his successor s appears to be Robert Kennedy at, at, the, at the moment, I think it could affect his career, uh, not adversely at all, which is not the purpose, I assure you, of my raising the questions. Mr. Lane, to your way of thinking, what individual or what group of individuals stood to gain most from the assassination? Well, that really calls for some speculation on my part. I think that that area has been preempted by the Warren Commission. I prefer to stay in the area of fact. I think the only way to know the politics of the assassins is to catch them and ask them. On the other hand, if you were to conjecture, Mr. Lane, uh, what would your conjecture be? Since I won't, I can't say. Mr. Buckley, would you care to conjecture? Well, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it would just be absolutely divine if it could be proved that uh, uh, Mr. Oswald was subsidized by H.L. Hunt <coughs> and the John Birch Society, and the Minutemen, given a little moral support by a National Review, uh, <laughs> that uh, Goldwater cleared it. Uh, that, that would be sort of the, the, uh, the uh, Naples Ultra uh, in, in causing delight in, in many quarters of the United States. From, from the other the point of view, of course, uh, it, <clears throat> if it were, were proved that Oswald was a, a working agent of the Soviet Union, even, even if it was not proved uh, or not inferable that he actually executed the president <coughs> with the orders uh, of the party, uh, then, uh, then certain other people would take, uh, would take comfort uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the refortification of their own notions about uh, uh, about the existence of the internal menace. Mr. Lane wants to abolish the House Committee on Un-American Activities, uh, which House Committee on American Activities might here and now spot an occasional Oswald, right? Then. Well, they haven't, have they? How do you know? Well, we know we that... We haven't assassinated presidents frequently enough to know. Well, we do know that the FBI knew of Oswald's background, that they knew he worked in the Book Depository Building, they knew that that building was on the presidential route, and Mr. Hosty, the FBI agent who had seen Oswald's uh, family, about two weeks before, never did anything about that. Mm -hmm. And here we have, in the midst of the greatest security precautions, this man, who would have been fingered, of course, by the Un-American Activities Committee, had they known about him, walked right into the building, according to the commission, carrying a rifle. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, here the FBI yeah. knew about it and did nothing about but, but it. But Mr. Hoover also said, look, if you want me to, I'll round up everybody who is a conceivable presidential assassin. Well, we know it's too but, much but, of a civil libertarian to do that. that well, we, yeah. we know that you wouldn't let him do it. Otherwise, obviously, he'd prefer a police state, wouldn't he? Uh, but he said that, that this would make it, for instance, if, if uh, the president went to Chicago, uh, uh, the entire population of Chicago would be decimated to get lock up anybody who had any kind of a record. Uh, it's a terrible thing to say about Chicago, yeah. I think. Mr. Buckley, I think this leads us naturally enough into another question. You admit on the one hand that you've not carefully studied the Warren Commission uh, report, that you are generally satisfied even though you've not examined the evidence carefully. Would you have been quite so relaxed and offhand if the, if the Commission had concluded it was the work of a right-winger? Certainly. Anything you'd like to say, Mr. Yes, well, my, my point, Mr. Scott, oh. is that it was the work of a madman. Yes. Uh, and uh, I took, a, the, took this position from the moment the assassination uh, uh, was, uh, was, was talked about, uh, that it was so crazy an act, so wretched and sinister uh, an act, uh, that it was simply unlikely that it was the, the, the natural workings of a tight, coordinated ideological system that it was much rather and much more probably the workings of somebody who's individually impelled to act. I'd like to ask Mr. Lane one quick question, if I may. If Congress were to open its own inquiry into the investigation of the assassination, rather, whom would you consider competent to serve on such a panel? It's a serious problem. I would have said Earl Warren perhaps some time ago. But and Norman Mailer? Well, I would have said uh, Earl Warren some time ago, but I don't think I can say that now in view of his track record on this question. I think that what is more important than who serves on the commission is the methods employed by the commission. If they're open in public hearings, the last roll behind closed doors, with exception of my own testimony, if the evidence is made available, if we respect the adversary procedure and submit all of the evidence to the crucible of cross-examination and the American people see all of this take place, then I think we can have some faith in it. But I would like to see competent, non-governmental, pathologists from the leading medical schools, for example, serve, and other experts from the leading universities, law professors, and others serve on such a commission. We'll return to William F. Buckley in just a moment. Uh, Mr. Lane, thank you very much for coming, and I, I hope that everyone who has a doubt in his mind will read your book, and read also the book of Mr. Liebler, if he publishes Defending the Warren Commission, uh, and uh, other works on the subject. Thank you again for coming. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.